When we think of a habitable world, we tend to think of surface life, biased that we are because we are surface life. But the reality is that there is as much going on below the surface of the earth than there is at the surface, with comparable biodiversity and many unanswered questions, and may hold implications on the habitability of exoplanets. Known as the deep biosphere, it's the segment of Earth's biosphere that extends below the first few meters of the surface, down to at least 5 kilometers deep. Incidentally, that deep temperatures can reach 120 Celsius, or 248 degrees Fahrenheit, which is essentially the very uppermost limit for known biology. Any further and it starts getting too hot for anything to metabolize. And within that, there is an oddity. The hottest environment we've ever detected Earth life was around a hydrothermal vent off the coast of Washington State. A single-celled microbe known as Strain 121, or Geogemma barossi, this microorganism is a hyperthermophile, meaning it can reproduce in water at temperatures of 250 degrees Fahrenheit. This is hotter than boiling water at sea level pressures, but it can't go much further. At 266 degrees, its reproduction halts. But it doesn't actually die and can recover if it returns to lower temperatures. Strain 121 was only discovered in 2003, and before that time it was thought that temperatures this high would kill anything. Actually, lower temperatures were being used to sterilize medical equipment. Strangely though, this microbe poses no danger to humans. It literally can't infect us because we're too cold for it. Since it also stops reproducing at temperatures below 37 degrees Celsius or 99 degrees Fahrenheit. So far, no organism has been found tolerating temperatures above that of strain 121, but it's actually theoretically possible that biology could, in principle, tolerate up to 150 Celsius or 300 degrees Fahrenheit before the chemistry just stops working. Strain 121 is an archaea, and it's thought that the archaea may be among the earliest life on Earth, so it's possible that organisms like strain 121 go back to the very early days of biology on this world. The deep biosphere works very differently than surface life. On the surface, oxygen breathing and the consumption of organic material is the rule of the day. Below the surface, these are not available, so it becomes a matter of microorganisms consuming chemicals and minerals. But that makes for less available energy, so subsurface life tends to have much slower metabolism, as much as a million times slower than surface life. It's also thought that some of these cells can live for thousands of years before they eventually divide. And what their total lifespan actually is remains unknown. There are really two types of deep biosphere. The first is the deep ocean and the seafloor, and the other is beneath the continents and land, which actually starts a few meters deeper than the oceanic deep biosphere. Interestingly enough, organisms in the land deep biosphere are known as intraterrestrials. How those were discovered is an interesting story that started as a mystery. In the 1920s, University of Chicago scientists found that water extracted from oil fields contained bicarbonates and hydrogen sulfide, which are chemicals linked with life. At the time, that should not have been the case, as it was scientific consensus that nothing could survive that level of heat and pressure. Yet the scientists were able to eventually culture bacteria from the water, proving that it was indeed microbial life responsible for the chemicals. Also at this time, Charles Lippmann was studying bacteria that had been sealed in bottles for 40 years and found they could be reanimated. He wondered if that also might be true for coal dust, and he was able to reanimate bacteria and that heating the samples to sterilization levels actually favored these bacteria. In an oceanic environment, the scientific consensus was even more ingrained. Even though Claude Zobel was able to basically find microbes in any core he sampled from anywhere in the ocean, also showing that with increasing depth, the aerobic microorganisms gave way to anaerobes. This work was not immediately accepted in part due to the famous Alvin Submersible that first explored the Titanic in 1986, having been accidentally sunk back in 1968 while being lowered unmanned into the water. When the sub was raised, it was found that the lunches for the crew were perfectly preserved. In other words, no microbial decay, thus the cores must have been contaminated. This proved to be an error on the part of the consensus at the time, and subsequent work proved the existence of deep biospheres, though much skepticism persisted well into the 1990s. In 1992, Thomas Gold published a paper, and later a book, proposing a deep, hot biosphere. Gold was an astrophysicist, and his thinking went that if Earth could have a biosphere like this, 
then these kinds of subterranean biospheres may be common in the universe, even in the solar system. We don't have an answer yet as to whether any do exist, but we do know of a number of potential candidates where deep biospheres could exist. One is Mars, where subsurface microbes and liquid water aquifers are on the table. Other candidates include the ice shell moons, of which there are many, with Europa and Enceladus getting more attention, but there are many others. There's also Io's lava tubes, which may host persistent liquid water, though not likely much of it. Even the moon comes onto the table here, because if you go deep enough in the moon, you hit an area of clement liquid water temperatures, where at least hypothetically something might be living there. Research has actually bolstered Gold's work in that we now know that there are subsurface oceans in the ice shell moons. So if not life, some of the other bodies in the solar system at least hold the conditions for a deep biosphere. As Freeman Dyson noted about Thomas Gold, Gold's theories are always original, always important, usually controversial, and usually right. And on the concept of the hot deep biosphere, he was right. Interestingly, Gold would later note that the pushback against his ideas represented surface chauvinism on the part of the scientific community. What this might mean for exoplanets is a widening of what we see as habitable. Surface chauvinism still asserts here, in that all ideas of a habitable zone in a star system is based on surface liquid water in the Goldilocks zone. But when you put subsurface life on the table, this greatly widens to ice shell analogs in exoplanet systems, both moons and entire planets, but also the idea of subsurface land life on exoplanets that would not normally be thought of as habitable. For this, you don't even need an atmosphere at the surface for life to exist deep below the surface, and few other things are better at blocking dangerous radiation than rock. The problem is that exoplanets like this may not show any external hint of its underground biosphere, meaning that life there could be virtually undetectable from a distance. The deep biosphere hosts life beyond the microbial scale, including some species of nematode, fungi, and so on. It also hosts viruses, which attack the cells of the microbes living down there, perhaps adding evidence to the notion that viruses co-evolved with life and have been on this world from the start. In this case, however, the viruses contribute to the deep biosphere in two ways. The first is that they promote cell turnover, and they also play a role in transferring genetic information between cells, bringing up the possibility that viruses may be necessary for the evolutionary process in some way. This effect may represent a solution to the Fermi paradox, a rather unforeseen and very much unexplored one. If viruses are necessary to drive evolution and potentially even keep a microbial biosphere going, then might worlds where viruses never appeared remain forever microbial? This would make complex alien life very rare indeed, and fully explain the paradox with the aliens are simply very rare answer. And it would not be surprising that we see no evidence of them, because of the nearest ones might be in other galaxies. At the same time, however, one can also just as validly ask whether all life invariably has a viral counterpart. This is known as the virus first hypothesis, and then it goes that viruses actually predate cells and contributed to the rise of cellular life at all, meaning that to have cells, you need pre-existent viruses. The problem with this hypothesis, however, is that all known viruses require cells to reproduce. So if there was some unique protovirus that didn't, then it's no longer around. Other theories include viruses being reduced forms of parasitic organisms which is backed by the existence of very large viruses that share some bits of their genome with parasitic bacteria. The third is the escape hypothesis, where viruses were once part of host cells, but escaped control, and then developed from life's genetic material. In any case, the development of viruses seems inevitable, and it's also worth noting that like life, the viruses appeared at the very first moment they could on this world. The usual environments for the deep biosphere are the ocean floor and below, and deep below the land. But there's one other type that can be included that combines the two and offers us the closest environment to an ice shell moon we have here on Earth. It's Lake Vostok in Antarctica. That continent has about 675 so far known subglacial lakes, with Vostok being the largest. Its upper surface is about 4,000 meters deep under the ice, which is actually below sea level and is about 160 miles or 250 kilometers long, and about a fifth as wide. It's actually huge. It's the sixth largest freshwater lake on Earth by volume. This lake seems to have originally been a surface lake, 
when Antarctica was warmer, when it was sealed under ice about 15 to 25 million years ago. It's not thought, however, that the water down there is the original water from that time. The lake is under very high pressure, which keeps it fluid at sub-freezing temperatures. But modeling shows that water continually freezes out of the lake and is carried away by glacial movement, while new water melts under the pressure and replaces it. Further, there are two other smaller lakes nearby that are thought to be connected to Lake Vostok by subglacial rivers, something that's thought to be common in subglacial lakes in Antarctica. The idea is that every so often, due to varying pressure, large amounts of water are forced through the ice, suddenly interconnecting the lakes on that continent. The thing is, Antarctica has life, and probably has since the early days. And in the past, about 66 million years ago, at about the time of the extinction of the dinosaurs, through continental drift, it was once home to a tropical to subtropical climate, covered in animal life and an enormous rainforest. Some successor to that ancient life is still likely present in Lake Vostok, and it's thought to be a very oxygen and nitrogen rich environment due to the pressure. It too has life. Some microorganisms have been found in deep ice core drillings near the lake, though it was a microorganism still extant on the surface of the earth. This lake holds promise. First, the ice enclosing the lake contains a paleoclimatic record of Earth's weather and climate going back at least 400,000 years. Again, though, remember, glacial drift. That ice is moving and is dynamic. The first core was botched. They pierced the lake, but the antifreeze components of freon and kerosene to keep the borer from freezing closed contaminated the samples. Pristine samples, however, were reported in 2015, and there are plans to go through the lake and sample the sediments beneath it which might yield clues as to what Antarctica was like before the region froze over. So far, all evidence collected so far suggests Lake Vostok has microbial life, but no evidence of anything more complex has yet been found, though it is in principle possible for fish and other species to be present down there. Controversially, there was evidence of a bacteria that lives within fish gut biomes, and in 2020 an RNA sequence was found in samples that are somewhat similar to a species of cod known to inhabit the coastal waters of Antarctica, that has an adaptation for essentially producing antifreeze protein components in its bloodstream. But it could still just be contamination, so the question is open. But remember, much of the pushback for the existence of the deep biosphere itself was met with the same skepticism, yet it turned out to exist. Interestingly, the controlled dataset here was to also sample Lake Erie, and those samples showed very clear indications of human activity. It was unambiguous. Yet the samples from Lake Vostok showed no such signals. They just showed the activity of biology, including the cold ocean cod. The reality of Lake Vostok is that we don't really know exactly how to drill into it without contaminating it. The water is under pressure. Whenever the lake is pierced, the water within it rushes upward and freezes, so it's likely still pristine. But at the same time, drilling fluids aren't a good option any longer. And other methods like hot water drilling may come with their own drawbacks. But the bottom line is, this is as close as we can get to the environment of Enceladus in Europa as we can get on Earth, and offers a new chapter in the study of deep biospheres that will no doubt lead to surprises and new mysteries. What lives deep below the Earth, and by extension, what of the exoplanets? Thanks for listening, I am futurist and science fiction author John Michael Godier, currently living in a wintry holiday environment, though it's not too terribly cold in the lower American Midwest for this time of year. But January and February are coming. Happy holidays, everyone, and be sure to check out my books at your favorite online book retailer and subscribe to my channels for regular in-depth explorations into the interesting, weird, and unknown aspects of this amazing universe in which we live.